It's time. Time to come together, to come to God, come one, come all, to bring our all to the one who has given us his. The time is now to worship, to lift our hearts, our hands to the one who is worth it. It's time to set aside the time on the clock and watch what can happen in an instant when we focus our attention on him. It's time to approach his throne with confidence that he is good, he is faithful, he is able, he is holy, he is here. It's time to draw near, tilt our ear in his direction, be moved by every inflection of his voice. Rejoice in the risen sun, revel in the Father's love as we cast our cares into his hands and stand on holy ground. It's time to make a joyful sound, to bring our lives before the living God, turn our gaze upon his face and bask in the beauty of his grace. It's time to make space, make room. The guest of honor is in the room, the one who sits enthroned and crowned. Let's not wait another moment. It's time. The time is now. Thank you for the privilege, the opportunity it is for us to just bask here this morning in your presence. We thank you for this time of worship that we have had. And Lord, we look forward now to hearing directly from you through your word. Would you speak to us today, Lord, and we'll give you the praise and glory for all that results. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, I have lived a life that has seen tremendous changes. Probably everybody here uh, and a few generations before us and probably a few generations after are going to see some tremendous changes. Uh, In in my case, uh, in my life, it's in technology. And one aspect of technology that has just seen tremendous change in in just my life, my short life, uh, would be uh, in the area of television. Now, when I was growing up here in Moreno Valley, Sunny Mead back then, we had, on a good day, three television channels. <laughs> we had a mountain over here called Box Springs that would often block the signal, and so we got less than three, and it was scratchy, and it was full of snow, and now... On the, I, I, I have a television that I can't even begin to scratch the surface of the hundreds of programs and opportunities that are available to me uh, on this television that I have now. In those days, it was, gen, it was very much broadcasting. Now we have what is called narrow casting. And rather than emphasize a, 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 you know, just everybody watch this same show, everybody watch these, one of these three channels... Now people can be very, very specific in their viewing habits. I I went to my television, which is hooked up to the internet, which, as I said, gets hundreds of channels. You all know that. You have them too. And and these are are basically niche channels. Now, a niche is a specialized channel. It, it, It speaks to something very specific. So I just jotted down a few of the channels. Here we go. On my television, we have the Duck Dynasty channel, British TV channel, Dog channel, Cat channel, Bird channel, Bird channel, (laughs) the Sci-Fi channel, Murder channel, 70s sitcoms channel, 70s female sitcoms channel, 70s ethnic sitcoms channel, and the list could go on and on and on. And today companies, even beyond television, have found that they are going to make it better in their business if they find a specific niche and they begin to exploit that, whether it be books or beer or macaroni or mutual funds. What they do is they get to know their consumer and then they target their product to that consumer. It's really obvious in the music business. I mean, you talk about genres of music, and again, I'm just going to scratch the surface. These just came off the top of my head. Out there in music, you have hip-hop, reggae, punk, thrash, emo, soul, Motown, country, western, country western, classic rock, acid rock, pop rock, classic 
oldies, classic oldies, <laughs> easy listening, adult contemporary, techno pop, K pop, and the list could go on and on and on. Now, most people would say, well, I don't see a problem here, Pastor. This is relatively har harmless. In fact, many people would say it's a good thing. After all, it satisfies our needs to express our individuality. But the sobering fact, guys, is that this fragmentation has found its way into almost every aspect of our society, of our worlds. And the shows we watch, the food we eat, the clothes we wear, all of these become individualized to our specific tastes. And this morning, of course, we discover that it's even in the churches we attend. There was a website that I saw a few years ago that talked about finding a worship service in Los Angeles that would meet your specific needs. Now, it used to be you would go to a thing that was called the Yellow Pages. I don't even know if Yellow Pages exist. I think, I think it's yellowpages.com now. Okay, but it was literally a book of Yellow Pages. And you would go in there, and if you wanted to find a specific church, say I'm traveling around, Jackie and I would look for, and we did this when we traveled, we would look for an evangelical free church, our denomination. Uh, if we couldn't find that, then we'd probably go with some Baptist his church or something like that. So here is a, a th this uh, directory was not listed based upon denominations. It was listed based upon the worship style you would find in that church. And here's some of the types of worship that was listed. You think that there's just one Get this, there's a seeker-sensitive worship service, a blended worship service, a non-intergenerational worship service, a liturgical worship service, a traditional service, a King James-only service, a fundamentalist service, a boldly contemporary service, a Pentecostal service, charismatic service. Guys, and, and again, I'm just scratching the surface, there were more. Worship today has become kind of a, a, a Baskin Robbins 31 flavors of the month phenomena, or maybe to use a better biblical analogy, it has become a Tower of Babel phenomena. You remember the Tower of Babel from Genesis chapter 11? What were they doing? They were building this tower to heaven. In other words, they wanted to bypass God and we'll just build a tower and we'll climb to heaven on our own. And what did God do? He confused their languages so they couldn't work together. And sometimes we find, and when we see things like this, Christians are unable to worship together because they can't, or maybe better, they won't understand the worship language, quote unquote, that other groups are using. Was that chorus that we just heard or that we sang today, was that vineyard or Hosanna or Integrity or, or, or Hillsong or Gaither or Baptist Press? And that's just focusing on the music itself. How about the way the music is played? I was a, at a technical website, a church tech website, and it had page after page of emails of, of tech people discussing this question, how loud is your worship service? And they went on for pages discussing that. And I wonder sometimes, what have our worship services become? Because, guys, we live in a world, as we've already seen in this series, that has become fragmented, has become consumer-oriented. And I believe we need to ask a fundamental question, and that is, what does it really mean for us to worship together? In other words, what is a worship service? Is it mainly about our style, whether we're contemporary or traditional or any of the other dozens of other styles that are out there? Is it defined by the instruments that we use? Do we have a piano and an organ? Or, or maybe we've added drums? Ooh, drums. I remember that was a big deal in a Baptist church I was in 40 years ago. The idea of having drums on stage was a revolutionary thing, not to mention guitar. Or how about no instruments at all? There are believers, there are churches, whole denominations that don't believe you should have any instruments. Just sing with your voice. Or do we have, how about the means of conveying the words? Do we have hymn books? Do we have lyric sheets? Or do we have a big old screen up front? Here at Crosswinds Church, in just the time I've been here, we've had all three at various times. Considering all these discussions and articles and books, the questions can sometimes seem to be the issues that are at the center of what worship is all about. But are they? Or better yet, better question is, should they be? 
We've allowed, I think, in many ways, our society. We've allowed the world around us and our own self-centered views at times of, of my personal taste to cloud the question of what church worship is really about. Today, this is the third installment of four in this worship, this short worship series that I'm doing. And you might have noticed, and I've had a couple of you comment on that, we have yet to talk about worship and music style. Because I believe, and I hope I've made my case over the last three weeks, that biblically, those are actually secondary issues. They are important. I'm not saying they don't matter. They're important, but we need to see them in their proper place. A month ago, we had the first in the series, and we saw that worship is not a mood. Rather, worship is a response to God's power and to God's grace. Last week, we saw that in order to worship, we must have a knowledge of God as well as a relationship with God through Christ. And that if we truly are worshiping God, then his spirit will spill out or well up or bubble up to the people around us in our worlds. We'll not be able to contain it in word or in deed. The in, and these insights, guys, should impact us on our Sunday morning gatherings. And we're going to see just how this morning. The question again that I really want to focus on today is, what does it really mean to worship together? In other words, how can, this whole, how can we experience a worship in which the whole church participates? Turn, if you, if you will, in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 3. We're going to begin at verse 20. I encourage you to take notes today if you got a note sheet at the door. If you didn't, uh, put your hand up and we'll get a note sheet to you. And uh, if you're online with us, it's good to have you with us again today. All the material that I just mentioned is available to you online. Now, in this passage, the Apostle Paul has been instructing the believers at the church there in Ephesus. And here's where I see three facets of worship. Now, that might be a, 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 an unusual word. A facet just means a, a side to something. Like, you think of facet in terms of diamonds. You know, diamonds, you have all of these different sides and surfaces. And, uh, and, and it's three different, we're going to see three different facets or three different ways of looking at this topic of worship. And the first one we see today is the power of worship. Paul concludes a prayer that he has been praying for the Ephesians in verse 20. And look what he says. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work in us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. So first and foremost, what do we see? What is worship? It's about glorifying God. Not just here in our services. I've been mentioning this. This is coming up every week because, of course, it's true. It's mainly we glorify God in our lives. Worship is, a, is what people see in us every day of the week. So here, Paul reminds us of just why God is worthy of our worship. And in spite of what we may think or feel or, or even experience, he tells us here that God is not limited by our circumstances. He, he's not limited by our doubts. He's not even limited by our imaginations. Think about that. I'm sure there's people in your world that you feel that God has called you to reach and secretly, or maybe not so secretly, you think, this guy is impossible. I mean, I'm going to go through the motions. I'm going I'm to do what I need to do. I'm going to be obedient to God's word. But do I really think it's even possible that this person is ever going to be interested in spiritual things? Well, guess what? What did Paul say? He said he is able to do abundantly more than we ask or even think. He can do more than I can imagine. And as Paul finishes up his prayer for them here, he reminds them that God can do far more than we can ever even begin to conceive of. This became a real reality. I've had many people ask me since my sabbatical, what was the, what was the number one takeaway from your sabbatical? That's a tough question. I was, I was on sabbatical for three months, you know, and, and you want the number one thing. Nevertheless, as I thought and prayed about that, I realized I was probably going to get this question a lot, and here it is. The, the most profound things tend to be kind of simple, and it's this. God is sovereign. He truly is in control of everything. Now, you say, why is that such a big deal for you, Willie? Because 
the source of most of the struggles that I have is that I look at things that happen in my life as good or bad, or successful or failures, or, 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 or something that benefits me, or something that shouldn't have happened to me. I think in those terms, and so therefore I set myself up for disappointment, but the fact is, God is in control of everything. He's in control of what may seem to me to be the good and the bad, or the successful, or the, or, or the lack of success. He's in control of all those things, and he even promises me that even those things that I view as bad, and, and sometimes they are bad, sometimes I screw up, sometimes I do things that I shouldn't have done, but God in his amazing ability and wisdom is even able to take those things and turn them and move them and work them together for good. That is an amazing thing. And here's a key point in this passage in verse 21 that we often miss. What does it say? To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus. Guys, worship is not just a personal thing. And yet, as I said, we, we live in a society that is increasingly isolated, increasingly personal. Everything is oriented towards finding that niche that, that you want and then you go there and you participate in that all by yourself. And yet, what does he say? God's glory is in the church. It's a corporate thing. It's a group thing. Worship is something we do here together. And how long do we do it? Well, what does he say? Throughout all generations, forever and ever. It's not just here on Sunday mornings. It's, it's throughout the week. In fact, it's beyond that. It is eternal. It's not just, uh, oh, it's a way of life that continues everywhere forever. And that's the power of worship. And we're just scratching the surface, but I need to move on. Because Paul moves on to yet another facet of worship, another aspect of this diamond that he's describing for us this morning. And that is the unity of worship. Look at verse four, or chapter 4, verse 1. You know, when he wrote this, it was a letter. There weren't chapters and verse numbers. So we can, we can slip right out of chapter 3 into chapter 4, and that's the way Paul wrote it. So this, he continues this thought. He says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. For there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. You see, worship, guys, contrary to what we hear a lot, worship isn't just about my personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. It's easy to think or even hope for that in our society today because it, it, that's, that's what our society does. We think about ourselves, and so we tend to emphasize our personal relationship. And, and granted, my relationship with God is not going to be dependent upon what the group does. It is going to be dependent upon my personal decision for him. But it's also, guys, about, and it's mainly about, as Paul says here, our relationships with each other when it comes to our walk with him, to our lives with him. Look at verse 4 and 5. One body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord and faith, one baptism, one God and Father, over all, through all, and in all. D do you get Paul's point here? He keeps hammering this thing. One, one, one. So what does it really mean to worship together? While there is tremendous room for diversity and for differences, in fact, as we talked a little bit about last week at the business meeting, those things are vital. Our unity doesn't make a whole lot of an impression upon the world around us if we're all the same. Well, of course you're unified. You're all the same. You all think the same way. You vote for the same people. You, you listen to the same music. You know, that, that, that wouldn't really impact anybody because so what? Anybody can do that. No, the impact of our unity is when we are all different. When people look at Crosswinds Church and saying, wait a minute, that person is, is worshiping together with that person? How in the world did that happen? Or like I brought up last week, you've got even the disciples you have, you have uh, Simon uh, the Zealot, 
The zealot who was a, a first century terrorist. They were the ones that, that would set the bombs. They were, they were interested in the violent overthrow of the Romans. And along with Simon the zealot, they had Matthew, the tax collector. And what is, who is Matthew? Matthew is a Jew who had sold out his people and went to work for the very people that Simon the zealot wanted to violently overthrow. Can you imagine the conversations they must have had? And yet Jesus here is giving us a tremendous example of what true unity is all about. It's not that we think alike. It's not that we are uh, unified. It's not, it's not that we're all the same, but that we are different and we are together even in spite of that because of what binds us together, the Spirit of God. The miracle of worshiping together, guys, is that it's not something that we can do ourselves. It's not something that we can put together. Community worship, group worship, like we're doing today, Scripture tells us is something that God puts, uh, puts together. You see, we don't create our own unity. In fact, we can't. We've seen this. The history of mankind is one of disunity. And of course, we're in a season right now, a political season where we see it every day. You know, you, you turn on the news, you listen to, you, you read the papers, you do whatever, and you're going to constantly see how we don't agree with each other so that when there is unity, guys, it is a gift from God, and it's only possible through Him. It's the Spirit that gives us this gift of community. That's the unifying force in every one of us, the Spirit of God. And it's our job to keep it and to maintain it. And Paul also points something else out here that's vital. Four times he uses a specific word, if you notice, calling or called. And once we realize what Paul is talking about here, I think our view of the church is going to be changed somewhat. Why are we here this morning? Why are you here this morning? Why are you in this worship service? Ultimately, guys, the Bible says it's not because of the marketing that we talked about. We didn't target you as our target audience so we can get you in here. If you, if, now, maybe you did see an ad, or maybe you did uh, uh, see something online, or maybe somebody invited you to be here today. But here, Paul says, we have been called. Look at verse 1. He urges the Ephesians, and he's urging us as well, to walk or to live in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. And then in verse 4, he points out, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, in one sense, you didn't decide to worship here this morning. You were called by God to be a part of this body. We are the called ones. And it's interesting that that phrase actually in the Greek means church. The word is ekklesia. And it, it's defined as called ones. That's who we are. We have been called to be here. That's what makes us the church. What does it really mean to worship together? You see, a worship service is not so much an event that's planned and executed. Rather, it is a gifted gathering of diverse called people, a community or as I often like to say, a common unity. That's what we have here. And it's a community of, of people who often have very little in common. And I actually pray for that. Because again, that makes so much more of an impact on the world around us. Outside of the identity and the unity we share as people called together by God. And guys, that is by design. So what difference does this make? Well, it means that a spirit of grace a spirit of humility, a spirit of deference. Maybe you don't know what that word means. Deference simply means I give up my rights to have what I want so that you can have what you want. <laughs> and so sometimes I will, I will be in a worship service and I'll say, and it's funny how this works out. We'll be singing a song and I'll be saying to myself, I really don't like this song. Maybe I'll talk to Chris. And to, uh, where are you, Chris? There he is. Yeah. Maybe I'll talk to Chris and say, Chris, don't ever sing that song again. But fortunately, before I have a chance to say that to him, eventually that morning, almost inevitably, I can account on it, somebody will come up and say, that song meant so much to me. <laughs> that is like the best song we have ever sung. And I'm like, really? What kind of taste do you have? You know, that, that's the way we are, right? 
And so out of deference, I have learned, unless there's something seriously wrong, and there have been a couple of, I think literally two times in the 30 plus years I've been here at Crosswinds, that I have literally said to a worship leader, don't sing that song anymore. And it's always been because of a theological issue or something like that. Not, not a matter of taste. Because there's plenty of songs that, eh, I wouldn't really listen to that if it wasn't for them playing it. But we give up our rights to do it just my way because I want you to have it your way as well. Instead of bringing into this worship center the, the, what the world gives us, which is this attitude that, of the consumer, and where we ask ourselves the main question, what can I get out of this service today? Instead, I will seek to give gifts of grace. And I'll say things like, which one of my brothers and sisters in Christ can I minister to this morning? As we saw a few weeks ago, instead of having a, a, an attitude of the critic where we say, as I just said, I didn't like that hymn, I didn't like that song, I didn't like that message. <laughs> yeah, I say it too. <laughs> instead, we will, we will seek to contribute to the service. God, what are you calling me to do this morning during this service? Instead of walking into the sanctuary the same way that I would walk into, oh, I don't know, a classroom or a, or a movie theater, I would walk in being prepared to, ta to be taught or to be entertained. Instead, I will come in with anticipation. God, what do you want to do this morning in my life? Think about it. Ask yourself right now. What did I come here today? When I was coming here, what did I expect to happen? Now, I say all of this, and I got to also add that we have a need for structure. We do have an order of service, but I can tell you this. I know the leadership of the church. I know the worship leadership as well. Often pray something along the lines of, Lord, please let something happen here this morning that is unexpected, something that is not planned in the order of service. God, break into our service and do what you want to do. And I guarantee you guys, that is always the best parts of the service. It's not the parts we planned out. It's not the parts that we cleverly executed to get you into a state. Hopefully, we are not trying to do that. There's a word for that. It's called, it's called manipulation. And, and we, we, we shy away from that. But it's easy to do you know, when you're, when you're leading music and worship because it does impact people on that level. So how do we leave room for this living and active and creative spirit of God? It's not all us. We recognize that. Did you come here today expecting something from him? And if you're like me, quite often I have to say, no, I came here today to execute the plan that I have in place. Well, just confess that to him. Lord, I'm sorry I am coming here. I, I do that almost every Sunday. I'm sorry, Lord, that I, I, I ask your forgiveness for that because we want to meet you here. We don't want to see just a cleverly executed worship service this morning. What does it really mean to worship together? We recognize this, that God has called us to this common unity, a calling that is the opposite of what we see in the world around us. Think about the rise of technology for the past 20 years or more. Streaming services, social media, social networking, gaming, artificial intelligence. Oh, that, that, who knows where that's going to go, huh? And many people, because of these kind of things, and you know them, we all have friends like this, they, and maybe you're in this category too, we kind of completely isolate ourselves from the people and the world around us, don't we? It's easy to do these days. I remember years ago hearing a, a comedian, and he talked about the old uh, thing that parents would do when the kid was bad. They would say, go to your room and think about what you've done. And this guy said, so the kid goes to his room, and he's got a television, and he's got all kinds of media in there, and he's got his phone. And he said, if you really want to punish your kid, don't send him to his room. Send him to your room. There's nothing happening in there. <laughs> okay. Our room has a bed, okay, that's about it. But it's not, and, and, and frankly, you know, uh, and maybe you suffer from this as well, because many people do. You take away somebody's phone, you take away their technology, and they literally go through withdrawals. They say it's up there in the realms of what drugs and alcohol and cigarettes do to you. 
But it's not just entertainment that we're talking about, is it? I know I'm speaking uh, to a lot of you here today when we talk about how the advances in technology and communications, because of them, many workers are commuting to an office or a workplace that is downstairs rather than downtown. We're connected by this this high-tech umbilical cord, if you will, to the world outside. People can live out much of their lives cocooned in a safely away from interaction with anybody else. And what about the church? Well, with the amount of live-streamed services today, we have one ourselves. Not to mention Christian books and online recordings. It's possible, guys, to receive quality religious content while seated comfortably on our living room sofa. Many of us have done it, right? And so some believers just stop coming to church. I mean, after all, why go to church when I can get better preaching online, better Christian teaching from YouTube, better music from my MP3s or iTunes or even CDs if you're a dinosaur like me? And for that matter, You can get more comfortable and inspiring views from your cabin in the woods or from your cabana on the beach. And so slowly but surely, God's called ones, the ecclesia, the church, become isolated. And we become okay with surrounding ourselves with what we think that is going to help us grow. I remember A couple of weeks before he passed away, I went to visit my dad in the ICU at the VA hospital. And going into the room, I had to sterilize my hands and everything, and I had to put on gloves and a gown and a mask and all that stuff, something we would later get used to as a way of life, right? And there were, as I went in to see him, there were all these monitors and IV bags and feeding tubes. And you know, I think of that now, and I think that's the way a lot of Christians have chosen to live. We isolate ourselves in wards of individual rooms, each occupied by a lone Christian hooked up with a spiritual intravenous drip, if you will, plugged into what they believe is spiritual sustenance, that spiritual feeding tube. And yet, guys, this is not what God intended. Yet many people, many churches see less and less of their people actually in the church for this very reason. We've got live streaming. Why do I have to come here? Now, don't get me wrong. (laughs) This is like, well, you created the live streaming. What's going on here? But I, I, I would be quick to say live streaming is great if used correctly. People can still join the service when they're sick or maybe they're unable to attend because of their health or there's distance or, there's, or they're traveling. Jackie and I were in church every Sunday the whole time we were on Route 66. But I'll tell you guys, it was not the same. We were observing, we were watching a service. I, I was keeping track of what was going on and I was being blessed. I enjoyed listening to what Charlie had to preach and what Trenton had to ple- preach. But I can tell you, and hopefully most of you can agree, that live streaming is not meant to be a substitute for gathering together physically if you can. The writer of Hebrews was very clear on that. Look what he says here. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together. That word, that's one word, meet together. And in the Greek, it literally means gathering together in one place. As is the habit of some, don't neglect to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. One of the reasons when the pandemic came, uh, you, you really couldn't win as a church. You know, whether or not you should meet or not meet. I had critics on both sides. And in the end, I had to come to passages like this because the elders gave me the, 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 the responsibility to come up with how are we going to respond to the pandemic. And so we said, if you're sick, don't come to church. Stay away, and, uh, and, and we're going to do everything we can to provide a safe environment. So we moved outside for the purpose of continuing to be together because that's what I feel God is telling us to do here. Now, if it were a pandemic where people were literally dying in the streets, that would be a whole different story. It wasn't that. They never closed Walmart. <laughs> they never closed Home Depot. And so we made that decision for the purpose of giving people, giving believers an opportunity to carry out what I believe Scripture tells us to do. 
What's God desire? Well, one popular picture of the church is the body of Christ. But I think another one could be a beautiful tapestry. If you think about a tapestry, this is the front and the back of a tapestry. And in a tapestry, you have, you, you have all of these different colors and, and, and intricate designs. And we are like those strands. I show the back because if you ever look at the back of a tapestry, it looks horrible. You know, and I, and I think of that sometimes when I think about what's happening in my life or even in my church. It looks like a whole bunch of strings and mess and everything, but God, you see, he's seeing the front of the tapestry. He's seeing the beautiful thing he has made us into that we're not going to get that view until we get up there with him. But right now, guys, it require, a tapestry requires all these different strands, and we need to be like that tapestry, carefully woven together to form this intricate pattern that God has planned for us. Guys, we need each other. That's what Scripture tells us. We need each other to complete the work of art that the artist, who is God himself, has in mind. Ephesians 2.10 says that we are his workmanship. We are his masterpiece created in Christ Jesus to do the good works that he has prepared beforehand for us to do. And we need every strand, every color, every thread to complete the tapestry that he's making out of Crosswinds Church. So what does it mean really to worship together? We allow our lives to become intertwined. A group community worship becomes a gift from our Father, not just a creation of our efforts. It's a gathering of people, you see, who are called out, ecclesia, and woven together by God. Now what exactly then do we do together? What happens when we worship together. How does it work? Now, I would be one that would say, nowhere in scripture does God give us a prescribed order of worship. He doesn't say, this is how you should do it. Rather, we see examples several places in the New Testament, and we get a picture of what God intended, and that's the third and final facet of our worship that we're going to see this morning, and that is the purpose of worship. Look at verse 7 in Ephesians 4. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Now skip down to verse 11. And he gave the apostles and the prophets and the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. What does he say? Verse 7, grace was given to each one of us. It was Christ who gave, as he says later, some to be apostles and prophets and evangelists. It is God's very nature, is it not, to give to us. And as 1 Corinthians 12, we read in there that we would find that all these gifts are manifestations of the Spirit of God, expressions, if you will, of His Holy Spirit working in our lives. And the, the, the Holy Spirit has given us different gifts to be used to serve Him and, yes, to worship together Him. By the way, just a little plug again, you saw in the announcements in about a month from now, we're going to have our spiritual gifts class. So if you, have, if you don't know for sure what your gift is, I, would, I can't encourage you enough to take that two-week class meeting on Saturdays and, uh, and find out how God has uniquely gifted you, not only to reach the world, but to worship together with the rest of us. What is it? It's part of what it really means to worship together, to understand that our spiritual gifts are for giving. The purpose of gifts is to give them away. You don't give, I guess you can give gifts to yourself, but spiritually speaking, that is not, the, not what spiritual gifts are for. The Spirit has given them to us in order for us to give them to others. 1 Corinthians 12, 7 makes this clear. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit to each. That means if you're a believer in Christ today, you have this. The manifestation of the Spirit for what? The common good. And one of those places where we will do the common good is whenever God's people gather together like we are today in worship. Again, these gifts are forgiving not for keeping to ourselves. So we should expect the Spirit to express a variety of gifts through a number of people as we meet together. The Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard, he once put it this way, people have the idea that the preacher is an actor on a stage and they are the critics, blaming him or praising him. 
What they don't know is that they are the actors on the stage. The preacher is merely the prompter standing in the wings, reminding them of their forgotten lines. <laughs> But of course, I'm also a member of the congregation, so I'm an actor too. I just get extra work. But that's the gift God has given to me. And I, and I relish doing it just like you would uh, relish the gift that you have. So the gifts that the Spirit has given to you are intended for you then to give them to others. But we are not only need to be ready to give our gifts, we also need to be ready to receive our gifts. In, verse, in 1 Corinthians 14, the Apostle Paul gives us what is possibly the best uh, picture that we have of a worship service in the early church. 1 Corinthians uh, 14, 26. What then, brothers, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. And you thought you just came here to listen to a sermon and to sing a few songs. Well, you've got a gift. And he wants you to exercise that gift. Let all things be done, what for? For building up. Not look at me, look at my gift. No, it's, it's I'm here to give that gift to others. They've been freely given and they are to be gratefully received. But the overall goal in all of this is that the church is built up. So what does it really mean to worship together? It means we share with one another the gifts that God has given to each of us. There's a Christian songwriter by the name of Matt Redman. And I was looking, I, you know, chances are he has written so many songs. In fact, I, just before the service, I thought, I wonder how many songs he has written, and I couldn't find it. I went online, and I'm like, how many songs has Matt Redman, how many worship songs has he written, Redman, how many has he written? And it said, one actually said, this is the internet now, it said they're too numerous to mention, too numerous to count. So uh, it's a lot of songs. And chances are, over the course of a month, we're at least going to sing one or two Matt Redman songs. Well, Matt Redman was part, he's, he's from England, and he was part of a church in England. And the church, obviously, if you've got Mr. Contemporary Christian Music leading your worship services, it was a super popular church. I mean, there were crowds, there were thousands of people. And this is in England, which is pretty much a post-Christian society. And so here's upwards of 10,000 people joining their worship services and they began to realize a lot of the reason these people are here is because Matt Redman is leading our worship service. And so they're kind of coming for the concert aspect of it. And the pastor and Matt said, this is not the way it should be. And in his book, Unquenchable Worshipper, here's what he talks about. He said, the pastor of our church did a brave thing. We stopped using the PA and the projectors, we packed away our instruments for a while, and we gathered in an adjoining room with nothing but our voices and our Bibles, and of course, our hearts. And this led to a whole new season of worship. We stripped away everything associated with style and preference and performance, and there was a real sense of discovering the heart of worship again. He doesn't say it in this passage, but I happen to know their attendance severely uh, was affected by that. <laughs> Thousands of people stopped coming to church until they began the concerts again. Well, he goes on. His song, uh, my song, The Heart of Worship, describes what happens. You know the song. When the music fades and all is stripped away, and I simply come longing just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your heart. Redmond continues, it was a song written out of witnessing what God was doing with our worshiping community. As a church family, we'd always given lots of time to responding to God through song. However, we had lost something of the sense of bringing an offering. Instead, a sense of consumerism had seeped into our services. Songs and style and personal volume preferences and all these things had crept far too high up the ladder. We'd lost the dynamic of worship being the, quote, all-consuming response to the all-deserving revelation of God. And that sounds like a lyric to a Matt Redman song. So in his book, he finishes up by saying, after a while, the worship band and the sound system reappeared, but now it was different. The songs of our hearts had caught up with the songs of our lips. And guys, I would encourage you today 
to commit like me, to return to the heart of worship, not only here in our services, but more importantly, where worship really is exercised in our lives, in our worlds, in front of those people that we have been called to reach with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as we begin today, we do that by focusing on God's power, by recognizing and living together in unity, which if you were at our business meeting last week, you know that that is our theme, that is our vision for the 2024-25 year of ministry. We're going to be focusing on our unity, so you're going to be hearing a lot of that and hopefully experiencing a lot of that. And finally, fulfilling the purpose that God has for us here and, of course, in our worlds through the gifts he's given to us. Let me give you a couple of takeaways and then we'll go to those worlds with our gifts. The first one is this. I ask myself as I look at this passage, is God's power at work in me? If you're taking notes, that's Ephesians 3.20. Is God able to do more than I can ask or even think or imagine? Do I have that kind of a relationship where, where, where God can do the amazing in my life and I don't stop it because I got to be in control of everything? And trust me, guys, I'm speaking to myself when I say things like that. I am a tremendous control freak. I love to be, to be in control of things, but I have to realize that more often than not, that's not what God wants in my relationship with him. He wants to be in control. Is he able to do that? Maybe you know him this morning and you've turned away from him in terms of those kinds of things. A lot of the stuff we've talked about today. We talk about the ABCs, admit, believe, and choose. Admit your need for Jesus Christ to to grab a hold of you and live his life through you. Admit that to him. And then believe that he will answer when you admit that and say, Lord, come into my life, change me, make me the person you want me to be, and then do that by your own choice. Say, Lord, I want this to happen. And maybe today you don't know him yet. Maybe you've not taken that step of asking Jesus Christ to be your Lord and your Savior. And it's the same thing. Admit that need. Admit that I I, I am missing out on what life has for me. A lot of this stuff is foreign to me. Admit that. And then believe that Jesus is who he says he is. He's the one that came and paid the debt we owed of our life. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And how did he pay it? He died in our place on a cross. Believe that and then make a choice to accept it because handing out the gift to you is not enough. You got to take that gift and you got to open it. And how do you open it? By confessing with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believing in your heart that God has raised him from the dead and you will be saved. You'll open that gift. So I ask you this morning, or I encourage you to ask yourself, like I do, almost daily this week, but I'm going to make it a regular part of my prayer time now, is God's power truly at work in me? Because I can so easily turn it into just this thing that I am creating between God and me. Second one, that was a long one. (laughs) Second one, do I bear with others in love? That's Ephesians 4, 1 through 3. Does my life honestly demonstrate humility and gentleness and patience. When people look at Willie, is that who they they think? Is that what they think? Oh, there's a humble guy. There's a gentle guy. There's a, (coughs) I'm sorry, a patient guy. (laughs) Through Christ I am, okay? (laughs) Am I eager to maintain the unity and peace of the Spirit through His Spirit. And then finally, number three, does my worship build up the body? Ephesians 4, 11, and 12. Am I here primarily for myself? I like the service. I like the preaching. This is everything I could ask for at church. Or am I primarily here for everyone else? That's what real worship is. My hope and prayer is that today you've seen that worship is, as Matt Redman would say, much more than a song. It's a way of life. A way of life that glorifies God, unites the body, and builds his kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. Pretty cool, huh? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word to us today, for this tremendous challenge from the Apostle Paul today. And Lord, may we not just hear this, not just be hearers of the word, 
But as James says, may we be doers of the word as well. Not because we're going to go out and make it happen. Rather, I am going to allow the Holy Spirit, the control in my life, to live through me. And then it'll happen. Thank you, Father, for this body, this ecclesia, this group of called out ones that I have the privilege of being a part of and worshiping together with. May we continue that throughout this next week and beyond, as your word told us today, off into eternity. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.